Uh, this one uh, is, again, one of my wife's favorites. We've actually had osprey land in the trees right outside of our condo and that devour a fish. Um, it, uh, I like the, the way this is set up and the color. If you notice the color was coming in from the side, it really did illuminate both the bird and the branch it's on. Uh, the clarity for the female osprey here, the eye. And everybody talks about the catch light and trying to get the eye of the subject. This is a great example of that. Okay. Now this, the metal larks, you know, my first chance to shoot a metal lark really well was down here. And I really do, you know, love to see them out in the, the areas where you can photograph them and listen to their songs. Um, again, you know, the colors and the details in the metal lark are really, you know, it's a great capture. Uh, but one thing I might do again, again, as you look at this, and it depends how you want to frame it or where you might use it, I might move it in a little bit. And do something like this. Again, it accentuates the detail in the bird and where the bird's residing. So it's food for thought. It is a very sharp photo. I guess the one thing I, I miss here is hearing feedback, but I understand why we have everything um, muted. But if somebody has another comment or a question, Please unmute and ask the question. I have no problem with that. Ah, uh, Mr. Pelligan, you know, the detail in the body and coming right at you. It's, um, I really do like the sharpness of this area here. Um, I shoot with a prime lens and I shoot with, you know, zoom lenses. And the thing I found once I got the prime was, boy, you can't back up enough when a bird or animal's coming towards you. So I can appreciate parts of the bird not displaying. But um, again, it's something to consider and how you might position yourself. This is a great photo, particularly in the background and it fits well with the bird. Um, Jay, you're getting some questions in the in the chat. Are you seeing ah, those? Oh, great. Okay, well, I can't see the chat right now. Oh, okay. You want me to, maybe Alan could read them to you. Okay, someone, fine. That's uh, one of the questions that someone asked Jay is, what is the difference between a prime versus a zoom lens? Okay, a prime lens has a fixed focal length. So when I talked about a prime, I have a 500 millimeter prime lens. You cannot zoom it, it is just a straight lens, but it's for, you know, for distance. My zoom lens is a Tamron 150 to 600. And so I can back that down to 150 millimeter and go all the way up to 600 millimeter. Um, and lots of times when I'm shooting birds in flight, I'll set it about two, 250. And then as I see a bird, I'll zoom in on it. As it gets closer, I'll zoom back. And it's done by hand rotation on the lens. So I can adjust the lens by doing that. And the other question someone has to you had mentioned earlier that one of your, uh, one of the things you enjoy is birds in flight, you know, that you use an, a higher ISO you had mentioned. What about the aperture? Um, interestingly enough, I was talking to somebody today, I just got a 
a, a lens and a new camera and they were talking about how I photograph. I shoot a lot with auto aperture. The reason I do is lots of times when I photograph, particularly up north, there's a lot of trees or there's other things that come to play. So I use um, single point and a back button focus and the auto aperture because then the camera is doing the adjustment for me because I've got a lot to do otherwise just to keep the birds in focus and things. If anybody's interested in the kind of photography I do, you can look at Jayhawk Photography. Um, it's out on the, the web. Okay, is that all the questions, Alan? Uh, that's it so far. Great, thank you. Gosh, I think I might know where this is at, but I, I really like the photo. The um, reflection is like glass there. So it was a, a very calm day. And in, the water just draws you back in. Again, it looks like it might be what people down here call winter because there's no leaves in the trees. But, you know, still looks pretty good to me. Um, the clarity is the uh, another thing that I would mention here. So this is a great landscape. The, the one thing you might want to consider, and I see more people doing this, um, and Lisa Langle mentioned this when she was talking. Sometimes when she does a photo, she literally divides it into three photos. Usually it's put on canvas, but this would be a great photo to hang on a wall and have three separate sections to it. At least I think so. Um, it just really does you know, have a nice color and caption. This I've looked at several times. Um, you know, again, these are elusive creatures. So to get a photo like this is really interesting. First, the detail in the photo, particularly around the eye and the whiskers, all this, the tongue, um, is exceptional. And you'll notice too, I like the fact it's on snow. So you've got this out here, you carry that, the detail comes back into the back and then the background's just back there. It's not overbearing it at all. Um, catch light in the eye. There's a good example of what people are looking for if you're in a, uh, a competitive world, but it does, it just draws you in. Um, again, one of the comments I have is when I looked at this, I go, wow. If you took and made this into more of a portrait, you can see a lot of the detail there. Um, I really like it like that. But again, it's how do you want to use it? What are you interested in? And what are you trying to show? Because I don't really know that. Now, Grey Goose. But the title here is really interesting, Grey Goose on Ice. Um, I'm assuming, uh, and Alan's laughing over there because I know somebody that likes Grey Goose, but this isn't what he likes. But he just like it on ice, I've heard. It's, it's just a rumor. Um, it's a great photo. Particularly, you got the, ca the catch in the eye here. You're you know, doing that. What I really like is the detail in the feathers and the way that's setting on the ice. Um, again, it's it's hard to do, but if you're able to do this again, or if you move a few feet, you might want to get whoop, get the shadows, because the shadows are you know look pretty interesting also. But that is a great photo, and I'll assume that's not taken down here. By the way, I want to comment on the fact that a lot of these don't seem like Florida photos, but they're great photos, and I think that. Again, anything we can share, we should. And you can learn from all of it, I hope. Now, this was an interesting photo to me. When I first looked at it, I go, what's the title again? It says, raindrops keep falling on my head. Well, I looked at it and I go, hmm. And I, I'll, I'll be honest, I moved on to another photo 
but I kept thinking of raindrops keep falling on my head. And the, the eye in the area up here and the raindrops on the head and on the back really, you know, show up well, particularly with the background that's there. Um, the detail in the feathers here and the colors. Um, I don't know if this was intentional with the vignette or not, or if it was just the way you caught it in the, in the lens. Um, a suggestion might be, again, if you take this photo and do a bit of cropping on it. And I did this quickly, so you could definitely do, get a little more of the, the shoulder and stuff in here. But to me, that's a pretty dramatic photo in that eye where you can see right into the soul of a bird. And there's your raindrops. I saw this and I went, wow. Um, this is a really, really nice photo. Um, the, um, it's magnificent in the sense that it's got a lot of sharp detail in it, a reflection. The colors are really complimentary. And then guess what? You got the little guy over here in the corner but this, it, everything draws you down to the lily, but there's a lot of activity behind it. Um, other than a magnificent photo, I don't know what to say. Comments, Rich, um, Alan out on the... Uh... Nope, okay. <laughs> now, one of these little devils lives right not very far from us. So he hasn't been bad this year, but in the past, it's a love-hate relationship. Um, the photo, you know, I love the fact that how sharp the feathers are, the snail that just got removed from the shell. Um, this, and again, I, I've blown it up and I went back and forth a couple times. It, I'm torn between it being sharp enough and not. If you get more of the catch light, and this is where I said about, you know, adjusting, moving a little bit. And again, it's it's hard. These, you know, these this is wildlife. They're not sitting still. It's not a portrait studio. So, but that's just something to think about. Or if you've got to lighten this up up in here a little bit. But it, it's a good photo. And uh, one other comment I had on Right now, try and leave your watermark off of it. Not a big deal, uh, but for submission here, we say no watermarks, I believe. But, hey, I'm more interested in the photo and what we might learn from it. And are you having fun taking the photo, to be perfectly honest? One quick comment, Jay, before you move on. And again, uh, just be aware of this uh, while this person picked a beautiful color that's very complementary to the subject to have as a border. Uh, be very careful when you're entering competitions about adding a border. Uh, it typically does not bode well with the judges. Here in the club, we encourage really, uh, if nothing else, a one or two point border to create definition. So in other words, the photograph that was seen earlier with the iceberg or the glacier, you know, where the mountains are very white, so it would not have been a terrible thing to put a black border around it just for definition's sake. Uh, and again, if the picture is black or has a dark background to put a very thin white border around it, but be careful about how you use borders when you're presenting an image uh, not for a critique, but in a competition. But don't be surprised in critique sessions if the judge, sorry, not judge, 
if the photographer does comment on that. Thank you. Hey, we were talking about wood storks earlier. I, again, I really like the fact that the, this in-flight wood stork is up there landing. Notice the detail, not only the feet, but the head, the eye, the whole body and the wings. And the tree also, but notice too that it's the, the sky, you, wherever it is captured part of the clouds out there, but got the blue. So it gives you a nice contrast with the white and black. Um, Just the detail throughout the photo. I looked at this, the Ahinga, and I go, wow, what an eye. You know, and it really does pop out at you. Um, the eye and the head draw you right into it, the, the photo. Um, the feathers on the neck are very, you know, you know, clear and detailed. But one thing that, um, again, I thought about was, if I if I saw this, you know, why put this here? It's not complete. I really want to focus on this. And so, me, being my obnoxious self. Hopefully I'm not to you. Um, if you look at this and edit it down like this, I think it becomes more dramatic. But again, how do you want to use it? What do you want to show? Um, what are you looking and how are you looking to present it or where are you looking to present it? Gosh, I was by this place today. At least I think I was. Looks familiar like Waxahachie might look on a foggy day. Um, I like photos like this. Um, sometimes it just, it's very moving, I feel. Um, it's, with it's, you know, it's titled The Fog, the Trees and Fog, and it does that very well. Good detail. Uh, this is one of those photos, again, um, you might, if you're going to make it a larger photo, split it up and make it into three sections or something like that. Um, it becomes very effective and a lot of people want this kind of art in their homes these days. Um, I looked at this and I thought, at one point you could lighten it up, but I'm not sure you need to because the, the real subject is in here and the clarity is in here with the fog. Now, here again, this is just an amazing capture. Um, the fox, you know, is looking straight at, I believe the photographer, but looking straight ahead. And so you got catch light in both eyes. Um, the colors um, around both the ground and the background really accentuate the fox. And notice you got all the legs in there, the color that carries forward, the fact that he's walking through this mossy area. Um, I really think it's a great photo. Uh, and it shows a lot of emotion was my other comment. Again, lots of times I like to see what you can do to draw in on the subject. And again, it's, it's preference. And you might even move this out to where you have a whole stick in there. But you notice it's still the rule of thirds for the most part. Um, those eyes and the whole face 
really you know light up. And look at the detail in the ears. It was there before, but I think it's just a little more pronounced when you do a bit of cropping on it. What was the other red animal? Oh, the, um, it was a Martin. A Martin, oh, okay, okay. Where did the they live? Where did they live? Well, I, I've seen them up north. Obviously that the one that was up before, it was in the, the snow. Um, I've seen them in Maine and New Hampshire. Um, I haven't seen any particularly in Mass, but I know they exist in Western Mass, for example. And I think they probably come down as far, I don't know if they're down here or not. I, I can't answer that. Okay, I, I'm from California, so that's why I was puzzled, but never um, seen one. You, you might see them in, in the mountains or up in, in higher elevations. Okay. Okay, so that was all the nature photos that we had. I really want to compliment the folks that put these in. Um, we say beginner to intermediate for class B. People here have done some, got some amazing work. And can you improve? Sure, we can all improve. Um, but, you know, you should be very proud of what you presented here. So if we take a minute, I'm going to back out of this group of Jay, can I ask you a quick question? This is Mimi. Sure, go right ahead. Um, <clears throat> what is your opinion on, for, I'm just going to take, for example, the Osprey. It, just because I had a lot of shots, we were on a boat and, and I, I had a lot of images of the Osprey where he, you know, he could hear the camera clicking and I had the same image, but he was looking at me and I felt like the bird looking at me was not as natural as the one that I uh, submitted. And, and how do you feel about the animal looking into the camera as opposed to, <laughs> I don't know what's your take on that? Um, I really, I photograph, when I find an animal, if I have it staring at me head on or coming at me head on, I have no problem with that at all. Um, I'm interested in the action. If you have like the osprey at first and the fish, if you can get both of those with the catch light and stuff, if it's coming at you or if it's uh, a side view, I think both are very you know acceptable. Matter of fact, I tried, I, uh, before I came down, I was photographing snowy owls. And uh, I was all the time trying to catch both eyes of the snowy owl looking at me and in flight. Um, I wasn't successful this time, but if you look on my, ever see my business card on the back of it, there is a snowy owl flying directly at me with you know, both of its eyes wide open. So enjoy. If you can get a good photo and you like it, then great. Okay, so I, I think what you're saying is that the light is more important in his eye. And, and that's something that I wasn't paying attention to. So I'll, I'll go back and look at that. Yeah, you want the catch light. And I just put up the zoology pictures and I'm sure you can see the cormorant that's in front of me right now. Uh, look at the eye. That's, you know, you're looking into the soul of the bird is what I've heard a lot of people say, or an individual, even people that do portrait photography. You know, they're always looking to, you know, look into the eye. Especially okay, breeding so I'm, season. I'm sorry? Especially breeding season, their eyes. Oh, yes. Everything gets Definitely. lit up. So we have a double crested cormorant. And the comment I met was the intense, it's an intense portrait to me because of the eye and the whole beak and just that, you know, capturing that head. Um, and you wonder what, what's this bird thinking about? There's a couple things it could be, 
but we're not going to go into that. But uh, I also like, look at the hook. So, you know, when this guy goes hunting, he's, or, you know, for fish, he's already got a way to, you know, you know, latch on to his prey. And it's great color, both of the bird and the background. I looked at this and it just kind of made me happy. I have two granddaughters who love bears and um, that made me think of them. The um, panda having a snack, again, there's some really great detail in here. If you looked at the, down here in the front, all the way to the back in the tree, you got some very, very nice detail. Good color. Um, but the one comment I would say, and then again, here's where I say if possible, move two feet, three feet, whatever you can to each side and take a few shots. Um, I, I look up here and I know the eyes are there, but they're not, I can't get the catch light in them. I see the patch where they're at, but if you look at the mouth and stuff here, that's fairly clear. If you had the eye, wow, what a shot. Same thing with the ears. Remember the um, fox that we looked at and you can see down the fur and stuff in the ears. Minor detail, you might be able to lighten that up and uh, get that through some of the post-processing. I don't know, but it is, it's a good shot. It's a good photo. Gosh, and look at this young man out here doing the dance. Um, you, you, the photo was, you know, the way it was captured is really interesting. Um, finding birds that are doing mating dances or anything that's going through a ritual is always, to me, lots of times I stop, put the camera down and watch what's happening. But I also take a lot of photos too, so. Um, I can't say I do that as much as, you know, I may talk about sometimes. Um, it's a good blend of color. Again, look at, you know, your bird, look at the, the limb, and then look at the background. It really accentuates the bird. Um, again, notice that there's some blur down here. Um, there's different ways, and depending on what you want to do with this, uh, one thing you might consider is so you don't want things that distract from the bird. Uh, if I could, without cutting this short, I would move that leaf completely out. But when you try that, it doesn't work that well, I don't think. But again, I'm interested in that. You see the bowing action, the, the color and detail, the wings, the eye. Just food for thought. Gosh, Martin's a ruffle poplar down here. I didn't realize that must be sand on the ground, right? I, if you can tell me where that sand is down here, I'd love to go see it. Uh, now, you know, all kidding aside, this is a, a great photo again. One of the things about Martins, notice the coloring. And if you, if you ever look these up online or if you're around them someplace up north, because that's the only place I've seen them, um, this coloring can change dramatically from just different animals. Um, but this is really outstanding with the catch light and notice how all the fur, the detail is there, including those little toenails that I'm sure are well manicured. Um, what would I do? <laughs> Gosh, you probably already know what I do. But again, rule of thirds, Sometimes I just like to 
the face is what really intrigued me. And look at the whiskers. Look at the detail in the fur when you crop in on it. But again, what do you want to do with the photo? Where do you want to show it? Um, now, again, this is a Microsoft. I'm running Microsoft Windows now. I was a Mac user until about six months ago. I switched back to Windows just because it was a heck of a lot cheaper than rebuilding my systems with Mac, which I had for about 10 years. Um, this is just, I, you know, I processed some photos or the, the photos you sent in came over to me. I haven't done anything. I just clicked on them on Windows, but you do have some fair amount of capability here in editing. You can move things around a bit. Um, again, I don't really use the tool, but it was easy enough for me to just pick up. Oh my gosh, look at this guy. Um, the, the terrestrial iguana, as it's noted here, the eye, it really, it, it pulls you in. Um, it's a very intense looking character, which they usually are. I was actually down at Pond Talk yesterday and saw one huge iguana swim over the corner of the pond which I was surprised if I was an alligator at first, but it was probably a very large, well, it was a very large iguana. I have pictures of it. Um, the, the comment here I'd make is this is pretty sharp and you're, it's, it's a bright day, that's obvious. But if you go down, some of it's not quite as sharp as you might want it to be. And again, you might try some tools that sharpen that, or you can just you know think about how you photographed it. And sometimes if you take multiple photos, when something's moving, you'll catch the one second where he stopped. So shooting in burst mode is not necessarily a bad thing. Just be careful, you don't want 6,000 photos of the iguana's head. Um, and I'm like, the D500, or the Z62 I have, it, it starts racking up photos really quickly if you put it on burst mode. But it's another way to capture anything that's moving and just short burst and so you can get it home and take a look at it. You could do some cropping on this, but you know, it is what it is. If you're looking for the iguana, you got it. The, these again are, a, I think anybody who photographs birds always wants to try and photograph a hummingbird. And it's got to be one of the most difficult birds to photograph, not only because it's buzzing around. I didn't say flying, I said buzzing. Um, and I do have a tendency to photograph these two or three times a year. And boy, does it, you know, when I photograph them, I photograph them at a high ISO and um, auto aperture. So, because they don't stay in one place all that long. But I like the photo. It's a lot of this out here is distracting. Again, you know, if you're in a contest or something, they'll say, what's the story? Well, the story is, the uh, hummingbird on the plant, but it's kind of, you know, left out there in the middle of things and it's not the rule of thirds. So if you try to be a little creative here, all of a sudden you've got a hummingbird, again, motion on wings on, Hummingbirds and some of that, uh, if a lot of people, that doesn't bother them. They want to know that they got a, a good sharp eye. The plant they were going to is clear. Uh, the tail feathers where possible are, are clear. So this female hummingbird, really, 
I think, you know, zooming in on it a bit, either with your camera or um, in post editing can make a difference. Questions or comments? Alan, you keep me straight over there. Uh, nothing so far except for compliments on some of the photos that have been. Uh, yeah, I think so again, far. we've got some great photos here. Hey, Jay, this is Paula. I'm having a brain fart. Explain the rules of thirds again, please. I'm sorry, come again? Explain the rules of thirds. I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> the rule of the thirds. Oh, the rule of the thirds. Okay. Um, when, if in competitions and lots of times just people talking, they'll say you want to have your photos, if you think about in thirds, you got a th two lines down here in the middle, and then you got the outside. Likewise, you got the top. So it, it turns into quadrants. So if you think of the rule of thirds, what you want is your wildlife shots. They want usually in one of the outside quadrants, like over here. You want it in, it could be in the middle here, which isn't bad, but lots of times they'll move it up further. Again, I'm doing this pretty fast. So what you might want to do is, let's see. Bring this in a little bit more. So now by rule of thirds, this bird, hummingbird, is in the right quadrant on the bottom and middle quadrant. And that's all it's about. You can move it up. Oops. <coughs> Pardon me. But again, notice you got a lot of blank space here. So that's the reason I had tried to position it something like this. Again, I'm just playing with it a bit. Does that answer the question? Okay. Uh, I am hard yeah. of hearing and I took yeah, my hearing well, I aid was, out. I was muted, thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. Not a problem. I am hard of hearing and I took my hearing aids out because there was some feedback. So hopefully I'm not blasting you away and we're doing okay here. When I saw this photo and it says, what shows up when you're waiting for something else? And I, I hesitate on the else because I think everybody that's on this call has been waiting for something else to happen. And you might get a little bored. You might get a little fidgety. You might get a lot of things. And uh, lots of times when that happens to me, I get the rear end of what I'm trying to photograph versus other uh, parts that I would like to get. So I can, uh, I understand what this person's saying. Let's put it like that. Um, the, let me move over on the notes here. The back of the bee on the flower, notice there's some reasonable detail back here. I know that's the eye, but I also know the wings out there and it's kind of blocking what it's doing, uh, the eye. And you can't you know, see the you know, gathering pollen, I don't think as well as this area seems to be fairly clear, but as you move up, down, and out, it becomes blurry. Um, it is what it is. I mean, the eye of the beholder, you did capture the bee. You did capture it um, grabbing uh, the nectar. But you might want to try and think about um, you know, shooting multiple shots or look at the back of the camera. I do that an awful lot. And after I'll take some shots, I'll take a look at them. I don't necessarily try and delete on the camera, although I do from time to time. 
Um, but I want to get a sense of what did the photo look like. And uh, again, this space up here, I, it's not adding anything uh, in my mind, but that's something you may want to try and you know crop out. Okay, you're, we're getting near the end here. The comment is, have you seen mom? Again, where in Florida do these uh, critters exist? Uh, I, I, I guess I missed it when I crossed over from Georgia. Uh, no, seriously, um, it's a, an interesting shot. Uh, I think that must be dad in the middle and the two young ones on the side. But when you can get a shot like this, it, it does tell a story. And you know, they're looking down at you or something down there. And, um, so it's, it's interesting to catch wildlife when they're doing something um, that you may find amusing at the time, or you may find very interesting. Uh, a comment here, I would, again, I photographed a lot of things like this, um, and I try to move, I'll take a few shots, I'll move forward, back, the right and left, uh, because you'd be amazed at what just a couple feet will do to the dynamics of the photo. And lots of times these, these guys are looking for something or looking at you, whoever the photographer is. So they may stay there for a bit. I'm not saying you have hours to do this, but you know, you can move along quietly and shyly. You can get by with a lot of things. At least that's my experience. My God, and when I saw this, talk about eyes and talk about intensity and being drawn in. Notice that, you know, this little kitty cat is stretched out across the whole picture. And uh, there was some lady I had, uh, I understand likes cats. Uh, this one I understand will come to your house. Okay, it's bad humor. I don't see anybody responding to me, so I'll move right along. But seriously, uh, look at the detail, not only in the cat and the eyes, but the whiskers the blades of grass down here. And then it's nice and soft. The only comment I had was, look at this white dot. If you're doing competition, somebody would say something about that. If you're doing it for yourself, I'm looking at it. This is a tremendous photo. I think a lot of people would be very envious of it. Okay, with that said, I think I went through all the 20 some photos that I had submitted by the B group. And again, compliments to everyone in the B group that submitted. If you have any comments for me, feel free to email me too. It's, um, I think you can find my email address on the, uh, the website. Comments, questions? If not, Alan, it's yours and I'll look All for right. questions for you. <laughs> okay, uh, I will stop sharing your screen now. Yeah, whoops, okay. okay. So I have to congratulate everyone in the uh, B group, which is beginner to intermediate. This is not a comment to be nice, but it's a very sincere comment. Those were some outstanding pictures in that group. Uh, I think many of you, if you chose to be in that group, are not giving yourself enough credit and need to recognize the quality of your work across the board. Uh, in that group really, really stands out. Or Jay and I are doing a tremendous job along with the rest of the committee in raising the quality of everyone's work. <laughs> so anyway, with that said, that, that really was a great showing this evening. So, you know, thank you to all of you in the B group that participated. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna be reviewing the A group and let's see. Okay, it's sharing the wrong screen. Let's see if I can get this to show. Uh, all right, I guess it won't let me show Photoshop. So let's see. 
Jay, what do you think the reason is that it may not be giving me Photoshop as? I don't know, because you're on the Mac right now, and I don't. Oh, that's right. Alan, this is Rich. Yes. Um, typically, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking from the PC standpoint, but I suspect it's going to be the same thing. And Scott can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you have to have Photoshop open first and then go to it uh, uh, from Zoom. OK, yeah, it is open currently. So let me see. Let me see. Because when you, you share the screen, uh, you should see a block of everything oh. that you can click on. All right, I had to minimize my Photoshop screen to do so. Thank you, Rich. Okay, back to All me. All right, uh, let me make the screen a little bigger. So I apologize for the technical difficulties. I am in the process of rectifying it. I just want to get the images as large as possible. So this should do it now. Okay, so this here is the A group in zoology. And uh, this one here is entitled Fish. I'm just going to reiterate uh, what, I, what I encourage all of you to listen out for this evening are the consistent comments that photographers make about the work. And it's not about if you agree or disagree with it. It's more or less how you apply what's been said to your photography and how it helps you to improve your photography. So keep that in mind. And as Jay mentioned, the comments are subjective. So depending on the photographer looking at the work, you know, you may get considerably different comments or very similar comments in general. Uh, I use Photoshop. It's what I've used forever. So that's what I'm going to be showing the images in tonight. So we start here with the one called fish. And the one quick comment I'll mention is if you're competing, typically judges do not look at the names, even though we have some very clever names and I personally enjoy seeing very clever names, but the names typically don't affect the judge's impression on the scoring of the image. So with that said, uh, this hair is actually a beautiful image of Koi. Uh, it's an underwater shot. And, you know, what I really like about this shot is it shows very, very dramatic movement. Uh, what appears to be the tail of the subject coin in the center actually creates a very nice fringe around the frame of the photograph itself. And while nothing is in this image is super sharp, it is sharp enough and not every image has to be super sharp to be a good image. This image actually has, it, it conveys a great mood in it. Uh, the only thing I think that can be done to this image to really sort of enhance it a bit is what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna turn up the, I'm gonna actually add a little more detail in the image and then, uh, what I'm basically trying to do is just sort of add a little bit of contrast to the image itself. So you can see here. And then what I'm looking at too is this very bright spot in the corner. The only thing I'll, I'll do for this is using the clone tool, which this club does allow for, I'll just sort of take that white down just a little bit and now you can see from you know, what the image was to what it is, and you decide what you prefer. Uh, you know, it, it can make in the viewer's eye a very dramatic difference between just adding a little more contrast and taking any of the bright spots that tend to draw the eye away from the subject. But again, just to reiterate, a subject or photograph does not have to be super sharp all the time to be an excellent photograph. A lot of the times it's the mood or the emotion that the photograph conveys to the viewer. This next photograph tells a great story. Uh, this one here is, for those of us who may not know, it's entitled Monarch, Caterpillar, and Chrysalis. And it actually is a very nice shot. It tells a very nice life history story showing not just the 
chrysalis of the monarch, but also its caterpillar. And you can see there's some really beautiful water droplets or rain droplets on the chrysalis. Uh, the only comment I would make is look out for depth of field. And for those of you who may not know what depth of field is, let's assume where the camera focused was on the back end of this chrysalis. Uh, the depth of what depth of field means is how much in front and behind of the point on which you focus remains in focus. You can see the, the thorax and head of the chrysalis is out of focus. You know, not the worst thing, but again, depending on use of your photo, some people may comment on the depth of field in the image. Some may just appreciate the fact that you caught a monarch precariously uh, hanging from the milkweed on this thread of silk that's on it. Uh, the only other thing I do with this image is down below, there's a little too much negative space. So again, you decide what helps you to create the story you're looking to tell. Uh, cropping out that little extra area actually can create slightly better focus on the intended subject. So in other words, you're guiding the viewer's eye in a nutshell is what you're doing. This image here, I think has really nice mood to it. I like the fact that it's essentially sepia tones throughout. It's, it's almost a duotone type image. Uh, you know, the background really complements the the, the dare very, very nicely and its coloration. Uh, I don't even mind the contrasty uh, light on it because the eyes and ears, the, the face of the dare is essentially very uh, nicely in focus, but overall the colors uh, with the subject work very, very nicely. Uh, because this is the A group, I'm just gonna make a couple of comments as I continue to show images of, you know, that can be uh, viewed here, you can see this tiny area where there's a blade of grass. Uh, if you had this in a competition, a judge will zoom in on that, meaning the judge's attention at some point will turn to it. Uh, and in the technical category, usually it's uh, impact composition and uh, technical, uh, they could knock you a point or two on technical. So always look at your borders. Uh, for those of you who've been around the club for a while, uh, border patrol is what this is called, you know, looking at your border. Look to see what's going on at the edges. And you decide whether you like what is or is not there. And again, as the photographer, it's your story that you're trying to tell, but be mindful. Alan, one question came up a minute ago. Sure. Was how do you change depth of field? Okay, depth of field, it depends on the camera you're using. Uh, if you're using a mirrorless camera or if you're using a single lens ref reflex camera, the number or aperture that you're shooting at is determines your depth of field. And typically the smaller the number, so for example, if you have an aperture rating of 2.8, that means your lens if, is, your aperture is very wide open, which means you're getting a very shallow depth of field. And if your lens allows you to go to f, f stop 22 or f stop 32, the higher the number gets, the greater the depth of field becomes especially uh, if you're not close to the subject. So in other words, the image in question where it was the monarch chrysalis with the caterpillar, even though that is technically a macro image, the photographer in that situation was not right up on the chrysalis. They were backed up enough to get not just the monarch butterflies chrysalis, but the host plant along with the caterpillar. If you're using a compact camera, uh, there is a manual setting that you can typically use on the camera. And depending on the camera, you'd have to look at your manual to see how to adjust what's referred to as the F stop or the aperture. 
And again, even on a compact camera, the smaller the number, number the shallower the depth of field, the larger the number, the, deep, the greater your depth of field. Uh, if it's with a cell phone, typically what you can do to make the best of depth of field, uh, I'm, a, I'm using an old iPhone 7. So I don't know if the newer iPhones have the ability to manipulate or the newer Androids have the ability to manipulate f-stop or, or aperture with depth of field. But if I want greater depth of field, what I tend to do is I tend to touch on my cell phone screen where the brightest area is on the picture as long as it's not taking the focus off my subject. And typically by bringing the exposure down, the phone is typically moving to either a higher shutter speed, which is automatic in a phone, or a smaller aperture. Uh, hopefully that helps. Okay. Excellent image of this turtle's head. Uh, shows really great detail. Again, as Jay touched on earlier, the eye, typically 99% of the time, the eye of the subject needs to be in focus for the image to be successful. It's not a 100% rule, but again, it depends on what the photographer is trying to convey. You can see the great catch light here where you can see the horizon with the blue sky, very sharp detail in the eye, great detail in the sand. Uh, the only two, well, three comments that I'll make on this image is again, looking at border patrol, you have on the left side here where I'm guessing that sky through foliage. And one of the things you can do, and again, this is a term from photography of old, you can burn in an area that tends to be a little overly bright so it does not detract from the main area of the subject that you want the viewer to look at. So in other words, if you look at this versus this, you can see how by taking the exposure down on a bright area, you're actually guiding the viewer of your image more to the focal point of your image. And the only other thing I may do is just crop up a little bit because the real story in this image is really in the turtle space. So again, it's up to the photographer and what they're looking to convey. And oftentimes it's not unusual, uh, it's not unusual for a judge to want to see a little more area above and to the right, typically in the direction the subject is looking in. Uh, let's call it breathing room or giving the viewer a little space that they can identify with the subject. And it sort of seats the subject into its environment, for lack of a better term, uh, instead of uh, coming in so closely to the image itself. So again, that's up to the style of the photographer, but things to keep in mind in general. One comment on that, Alan, too. Yes. If you hope to print your pictures, remember you want to leave enough edge room so you can manipulate it in the mat. Very true. Uh, that's another thing too, is uh, even if you were to mat your picture with or without a matting around it. So in other words, even if you were just to dry mount it without a mat, Remember the frame is gonna crop in probably uh, you know, an eighth to three sixteenths of an inch around. So you, you risk bringing the mat board or the edge of the frame right to your subject. So be very, very mindful of that. So that's a very good comment uh, in terms of how you use your image or what the intended purpose of your image is. If it's for publishing, you don't have to worry as much about that, if not at all. But if you're making prints for framing, it is a very serious consideration. Uh, this here is, is a beautiful shot, an amazing moment. Uh, you know, where Jay mentioned earlier, he loves to see birds in action like the osprey with the uh, needlefish. You know, to get these two Halloween pennant dragonflies uh, mating, you know, it's, it's an amazing situation to capture. 
Uh, I typically do not care if the subject is damaged at all. Uh, some judges tend to look for perfection. Uh, I, you know, so again, it's all, you're, we are always at the mercy, especially if we compete with our images, we are always at the mercy of the personal bias of the judge that's, uh, you know, that's reviewing the images. Just a couple of things I can do here. And again, these are always just recommendations. It's always up to the photographer in the end. What I would do is I would make this a little more vertical, because the, the blade of, of grass. And I would sort of crop in a little bit. And in Photoshop, I have, uh, you know, auto fill. So you can see where it sort of filled in what would have been white at the top and the bottom. And you decide, you know, which works better for you, which makes for the story that you, the photographer, is looking to convey. But typically, judges will look at a line that's, you know, if your horizon is just crooked a bit, they pick on that. Uh, because the blade of grass was just off, it was barely diagonal and not quite, you know, you may want to decide what you want to do. And straightening it up does make it, I think, a little more dramatic. Uh, the other thing you can do too is you have very good detail in your highlights in this image. Uh, you can even enhance that a little bit, you know, just because the image itself has good detail in it. You can see here where if you look at this area of the dragonfly, where just bringing a little more detail into the subject makes the area just a tad more interesting. So again, uh, always up to the photographer and what they're looking to convey, but really a beautiful image overall. This image here, wow, you know, beautiful subject. Uh, what I will say on this image is you're actually teasing me, the viewer, because you have this beautiful backlit, I'm not sure what to call it, so for lack of a better term, I'll say <laughs> crest because we're Autobahn, but I know that's not the correct term. But, you know, beautiful image where you've gotten remarkable detail in the head of the iguana, you found a subject that has, you know, this mature male that has this beautiful dramatic orange coloring on it. Uh, I don't know how close you were to the subject or what the consequence would be of including a little more of the ridges on his back, but just be aware and play with your cropping. I'm assuming this image was cropped a bit. Uh, play with your cropping on the image. The other thing that I'd point out is while you have one of his toes with his claws shown, another toe is cropped off. And some, again, if you're using your photography competitively, judges do tend to look at when things get truncated or cut off. Uh, you know, it draws attention to something that shouldn't have attention focused on it because again, the attention here is the remarkable detail in its head and the one leg that you have on here. So what I'll do now is Okay, Jay is the monarch up on the screen. Yes, it is. Okay, very good. Thank you. Oh, and the one thing this, you know, before it's too little too late, I forgot to give my quick bio. <laughs> I'll blame it on Nancy because she was being quiet and I jumped right into it and no one said anything. Uh, so anyway, considering it's sort of after the fact, you know, uh, my bio in a nutshell is essentially I've been doing photography since I was a teenager using film that was black and white. Uh, you know, and then I jumped into digital photography probably right as one megapixel cameras started to come into being. 
And those images were saved on a three and a quarter, a three and a half inch floppy disk. So that tells you that I've been using digital for quite some time now. I worked at Butterfly World for a number of years as a professional lepidopterist running their breeding programs. And then subsequently from there, I moved on to assist the Florida Museum of Natural History, the wing called the McGuire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity. Yeah, there's a mouthful for a name at a, at a museum. Uh, I actually worked with the museum to help them to start their live exhibit. And I actually ran their exhibit for a few years. But even before I got called in, they had sought me out to use many of my images on their informational panels and on some of their featured displays as well. You know, I also worked uh, with Rick Salmon, who's an award-winning photographer, do, does a lot of wildlife photography. Uh, he met me at Butterfly World and he was quite taken by my information on Lepidoptera, which is butterflies and moths. And he actually asked me if I would pen the captions for his book, do technical assistance for him, both with photography, uh, the naming or identification of the species, et cetera, in his book. So that was quite an honor to be part of that book called Flying F Flowers by Rick Salmon. And then my work you know, appears on occasion in Kaufman field guides like Insects of North America, Butterflies of North America, uh, more recently, I've had a few images uh, featured in Backyard Bees of North America, you know, and my work appears in numerous scientific publications, etc. So I don't actively market my work. It's just sort of out there. And if people know what I do or they stumble into my work online. So by any definition, I'm a very serious but possessed hobbyist photographer. So with that said, I'll continue on to the nature category in the A group. Uh, beautiful image of this monarch caterpillar on milkweed. Uh, always composition is one of the first things. Remember when people uh, look at your image, uh, especially if it's being judged, there are typically three categories in which it falls into composition, technical, and impact. And you know, very impactful image here but because there's so much negative space around, uh, what you may want to do is come in a little closer and you could actually crop this down to a square. And again, it depends on what you, the photographer are looking to convey. And I'll move it over a little bit just to sort of center it. Uh, centering is not always a bad thing. Uh, the alternative to you have, when you center something, you need to make sure that it's interesting and not monotone in terms of there's still interest to the viewer. Seeing the negative space that's in and around it is not even and creates interest uh, is one of the things you want to look at. Uh, if you want more attention on the monarch caterpillar itself, you can even crop in closer and it actually makes the caterpillar uh, more of a central or focal point and as you can see, the caterpillar begins to fall onto the, the one third quadrant, which Jay had mentioned earlier. So these are some of the things you can look at, but this image works very well as a square cropped in a little closer or as a portrait shot. Uh, the only other thing I might do in this image is because the highlight is reasonably strong. And that's one of the challenges we face in photography when a subject has very dark and very light areas on it. Uh, oftentimes you wanna look at, if you look at this area of the caterpillar, you wanna look at, is it overexposed or can you bring more interesting detail into it even if it's not overexposed like I mentioned on the dragonfly earlier. So be mindful of very bright areas on your images and how it, conveys the message you're looking to convey, or if it's going to become a technical issue to a viewer. Beautiful shot of this bleeding heart. Uh, composition is very nice. The background is beautifully blurred out and very complementary in terms of color to the subject itself. Again, for composition, the only thing I may do here 
is take a little bit of the space out on the left-hand side. And what that does is it creates a little more focus on the subject itself and create, you know, I like the space on the right-hand side because again, it creates breathing room or an area for the anthers to sort of unfurl, if you will, or sweep out from the center of the flower. Uh, the only thing I would try to do, but I don't think it would work properly, is increase your depth of field just a tad so you could get a little more detail in the anthers of the flower. But unfortunately, as you increase depth of field, you, you would inherently begin to lose that beautiful soft background that really showcases the subject. So typically when I'm doing photography, if I'm photographing something like this, and macro is one of my strong points, uh, the one thing that I tend to do is in a situation like this, I'll shoot at a few different f-stops because I personally have trouble looking at that tiny LCD screen on the back of the camera and knowing how that's gonna translate into a background that is soft enough to really showcase the subject. So, but this here is, is really a beautiful image that, that really showcases this flower beautifully. Uh, this image here of the great blue heron, uh, very nice pose. It almost speaks to the comments someone had, had raised earlier. Do you want a subject looking directly at you? I personally think, you know, it makes uh, for a very intimate subject uh, portrayal sometimes when it's looking directly at you because it's almost as if you, the photographer, are having a, con a nonverbal conversation with the subject, especially when in print. Uh, or, or whatever medium you're exhibiting your work on. Again, always very tricky when you're dealing with a subject with a dark area and a light area. Look out for what may be, you know, bordering on overexposed. This is not, you know, blown out. There is detail in here that I can see. Uh, I'm not sure what happened in this image if the photographer originally had a border on it that they cropped out, but there is what appears to be the remnants of a border on the left, sorry, my other left, that would be my right side, <laughs> and the bottom of the frame. You know, but very interesting pose on the great blue heron. Uh, again, you know, beautiful contrast between, or complementing contrast, I should say, between the beautifully blurred background and the subject itself. Uh, amazing moment captured of birds in flight, a very, very difficult thing to do. Again, what plays into a comment here again is the difficulty in photographing a subject that's black and white. Uh, the most difficult thing always is how do you retain the most amount of detail in an area that will inherently in direct sunlight, no matter what you do, have an overexposed area. In this case, just bringing in the highlights a little bit, I'll bump it up a little more. When I undo the preview, if you look at the body of the bird, you can see it brings in what becomes more depth on the bird. And even though this area here, no, ma no matter what you do, even with, with the naked eye, you're really not gonna see a huge amount of detail here, but you can see where the extra detail in the body of the bird uh, brings in more depth for the subject. And what it does too, is it also deepens the blue of the water. So it's not actually too bright and competing with the dark side of the image, but beautiful shot overall, you know, very dramatic. I love that the, the wings are completely spread open. Uh, the legs are at a beautiful diagonal, uh, very, very excellent moment to capture on this bird. Uh, so very well done on this. Again, and Hinga's always a very popular subject to focus on, no pun intended. Uh, I love that the person here took the very, very brave step to convey what is a, I'm guessing this bird had breeding colors on it. 
meaning the eye would have been a beautiful red with blues around it with a beautiful orange beak. But wow, it works beautifully as a black and white. Uh, always again, be careful when part of your subject comes very close to the edge of your image. Uh, there are two ways that this image actually can be cropped successfully, I think. You can actually make it a portrait of the Anhinga. And I'll just move this up a bit. So unfortunately, this is low resolution. So I'll leave it back at its native size where you can see the sharpness. You can see giving it a little more room on the top and to the right gives the bird the ability to sort of have part of the area of the image to look out onto. So this is one way to crop this image. Another way to crop this image, you know, so this image is what I would consider to be, you know, a somewhat versatile image. And sort of going back to the rule of thirds where you put the subject in, in the rule of thirds uh, is sort of, sort of creating it off and to, I don't know if it'll do the autofill seeing I've done it once before. You're, you're sort of creating a nice offset where it's very artful. You're creating a lot of very nice yet complementing negative space that doesn't necessarily detract from the subject, but a very successful and brave move uh, using this image as a black and white. Beautiful detail overall, uh, which makes this image very successful as a black and white. For those of you who are not comfortable with black and white or would like to do a little more black and white, uh, some of the key things, two of the key things that make for a successful black and white is you need to have a lot of contrast as you can see this image has and typically a lot of pattern also helps. So if you have contrast and pattern in a subject or in your scene, there's a very good chance it has the potential to successfully go from a, a color image to a very successful black and white image. Beautiful shot, beautiful moment. Uh, birds in flight, as we all know, can be very challenging. Birds in flight with prey is even better. Uh, this turn here, you know, I love the fact that its tail is spread open. I'm guessing it's coming in for a landing to feed its chick. Uh, you know, again, very little we can do about this on occasion. The sun is on its back, which gives beautiful detail through the wings from the underside. Uh, beautiful detail overall on the image. Uh, you know, th this blown out area, blown out meaning there's no detail in it, is very difficult to avoid, but just be careful the extent to which you have it. Again, I'll just demonstrate here by adding a little more detail into something that is already had very good detail. If you look on the, on the wing of the bird, you decide if you like it more with a little extra detail in it, or if you like that light, airy, translucent uh, feel that it had before. Again, that's up to the style of the photographer. And as Jay mentioned earlier, look out for your bright spots. So these areas you'll want to burn in a bit so that they do not ultimately draw attention away from the viewer. You, uh, what I'm doing right now is burning in. That's a term that comes from when we actually did you know, black and white or color prints. And it's where when you were projecting the negative with light through it onto the paper, you were actually physically putting something to between the light and the print that's called dodging. Or if you actually have a piece of uh, paper or board cut out with a hole in it, that way you let light in over a very specific area for longer than the remainder of the print, that's called burning in.
So you decide in terms of the technical aspects you're looking to display, you can see the difference between the brighter and the darker uh, spots on the image and how it helps to create focus on the subject itself. In other words, reducing distracting elements in the background of what is your subject. Another great shot, it's always nice to have things in motion and in just instead of just sitting nicely, you know, it always tells a very nice story and it shows, in my opinion, a lot of patience on the part of the photographer, you know, in capturing that exact moment right before the bee lands on the flower. Uh, the only thing I would look at here is this flower coming off on the right hand, on the left hand side. Uh, I really haven't been drinking yet, but I think I'm thinking Grey Goose from the B group title. <laughs> so, you know, this hair is distracting to the subject itself. So what I would do is I would actually crop it out. And in our club, we do allow cloning. So what I would do is I would actually switch, and I, again, I'm using Photoshop. I would actually switch to the cloning tool and I would actually clone out the residual area of the flower. So be mindful of when you have things, again, remember the term border patrol, you know, just doing a quick job what I'm doing now in Photoshop is some of the areas that may be a little distracting to the image. Uh, this is something judges will pick on, even though it's a natural spot on the leaf. Uh, judges do tend to look at things that can be a little distracting. Uh, even though this is, this is not sensor dust, this is probably actually specks of things that are on a spider's web or probably something that was floating around in the background. It may even be pollen getting shaken loose from this bee up here. Uh, look to see with things like this in an image, if it tells a story or if it's something on the technical side that a judge may pick on. So it's up to you whether you leave these in or not. Uh, but again, another very nice image, but you know, enhanced by compositionally by taking just a bit of the left side of the image out and cloning in the residual of the flower that was here. Another meadowlark, beautiful image of a meadowlark. Uh, you know, I so far have not managed to get a great close up like this or the one that uh, Jay had in the B group earlier. Uh, very nice feel to the image. I love the blurring in the background. Again, another thing judges will pick on is look at the highlight on the white area of the bird. So I'll see what I can do here in terms of, I really couldn't, when I was trying earlier, I really couldn't bring up a lot of detail in this area of the meadowlark. And there is detail there, I can see it. You know, but what I would do is look at your shadowing. You can see here that just by lightening the image, I'm actually showcasing more of the detail on the bird. And I'm actually detracting a little bit from this highlighted light area on the bird's head. So look out in terms of, do you want the dramatic shadows and highlights you know, play around with it. That's the beauty of the digital age is you can undo pretty much everything you do. And if for some reason you can't undo it, as long as you're not saving over your original, you can start over again. So look at your options and see how it works and what you like best and what best conveys your story. Beautiful image of a purple gallinule on fire flag feeding. Uh, really, really nice, very good depth of field. You can see everything from the beak right down to its tail uh, is all in focus. You know, that, that's just really, really a nice thing to see. Uh, the background is nicely blurred enough. Uh, 
I'm going to guess and correct me if I'm wrong, something was cloned out here. I see an odd artifact here that has very straight lines. Uh, look out for if you do remove or clone things out of an area. Uh, as you're the one removing something that you know is there and that was more accurately historically there, look to see if any artifacts remain that someone, again, if it's a competition picture, uh, you know, a judge may look at as an artifact that may make or break. Let's see if, that, let's say this were at Loxahatchee and you're entering it into their annual competition. You know, beautiful picture and contender for their calendar, uh, great action shot of a bird, uh, you know, but you have this little area going on and I would clone this out. Again, remember border patrol. So this hair actually ultimately pulls the viewer's eye to what it, especially because the bird's looking in that direction. You know, I would ultimately just darken out this entire corner. But again, that's an opinion. Again, it's in the eye of the beholder in this case, the photographer, what the photographer is looking to convey. But very nice image and moment. Beautiful shot of a hawk's face. Uh, you know, very nice to get it peeping out from through the, the foliage in which it's perched. Uh, you know, very good focus on the bird itself. You know, there's some full, you know, branches in front of it that are blurred that I don't think is a big deal. You know, so look, when you look at an image overall, my eye personally wants to keep going to the green leaf. I know it was there and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, for those of us who've been in the club for quite a long time, who've seen some of our presenters who've competed with their image, uh, images nationally and internationally, sometimes the judges knock something out of the running or even honorable mention because there were too many black pebbles on the sand on which the subject were on, <laughs> you know, that's distracting to the subject itself, you know, the a lot of the times if you're in these uh, big competitions, uh, they look at nature as if it's perfect and waiting to be photographed by the photographer. As we all know firsthand, it's not the case, but be aware it does play into a judge's scoring depending on the level at which you're competing. Uh, beautiful technical shot of this, uh, I've gone brain dead of this bird. <laughs> so, loggerhead shrike. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so very nice picture. The only thing I would look at is composition. Uh, in this case, being in the dead center of the frame, uh, I don't think really showcases or tells the story of the bird. Uh, but again, it's, it, it depends on the purpose of your image. If this is for a field guide, that's really showing the pattern on the face, the shape of the beak, uh, then it's great. Uh, if you're looking to enter it in competitions, uh, then the criteria change a little bit. Uh, some judges may pick on the fact that it has some, uh, some of the plant that it's been foraging on, on it. Uh, some judges do not but always something to consider again, up to the photographer. Uh, what I would do, I don't always like a subject that's very, very centered. Uh, what I would do is just try to crop it just enough where it sort of creates enough of an off balance tension. You can see where the breast of the bird is falling on one of the thirds and You know, slightly different image. I was trying not to crop this area out, but you know, again, you can play, you can play with your composition and again, have it complement your style. So again, being digital, you want to look at various options available to you in terms of how you wish to present your subject matter. Uh, the only other thing I would do too, there is some wonderful detail here in the white of the bird. Needless to say, all of you have noticed this beautiful uh, light captured in the eye. Uh, you've noticed, you know, just the sharpness, uh, focal sharpness of the beak 
although I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to be on this end of, of uh, its beak, you know, and you will want to bring a little more detail into the, the Shrike's face and probably even, so you can see here just by bringing a little more detail in, you know, you're creating that much more interest on the face of the bird. Okay, and that does it for the A and B group. I have to say, you know, we had a, and everyone can unmute now if you'd like, and you can, you know, you can share comments on thoughts, be it about technical comments, be it about personal comments from Jay and me. Uh, but the images tonight, you know, very strong group of images overall. I think you all are doing a very good job. You're not just having fun with your <laughs> photography, but you're really, really capturing some beautiful images when you're out there. So that's excellent. Whether it's in Florida or not in Florida, Jay. <laughs> hey, I'm the one that got criticized for having photos not in Florida. But those ones that got submitted, they had that white sand. They were magnificent along with all the others. Uh, one of the things we tried to emphasize is this, we're here to have fun. We're here to learn. This is not the eye of the beholder. There's no right or wrong here. And the more you photograph, the more you might be pleased with what you have out there. But it's all about your pleasure. And you know, as I said, and I'll emphasize it one more time, remember this is the digital age. As fast as we do, we can undo. So I would encourage all of you to sort of experiment with cropping, uh, experiment with different compositions and other words for your images. And then at the end of the day, save, you know, two, three or four versions, depending on what the image allows for creatively. Like you saw what I did with the Anhinga. It could have been a portrait shot. It could have been a landscape shot. And I think personally, both work extremely successfully. So, and again, because it's the digital age, what Photoshop has, I'm not sure about the other programs. It has an auto fill. So you saw when I cropped beyond the edge of the image, if the image was a blurred section of the image, it auto filled it seamlessly. And Photoshop typically does a very good job of that. So I've grown to like it. Unfortunately, Photoshop does not always autofill uh, for me, and I'm not sure why. I may take that up with Adobe to see if it's user error or if it's just a little kink in the programming, but it's a really nice tool to have. And you know what I try to emphasize in, in my comments on the pictures is there are always options. And remember, anything called a rule in photography is really a guide. So if something is a rule of thirds, you can break it. You don't have to be restricted to it. Again, it comes back to what you, the photographer, is trying to convey to the viewer with your style. You know, it's also said nothing should be centered. And sometimes something can be absolutely dead center and be more stunning than if you applied any rule of third to it. So remember, it's about the story with your subject and your style that you're looking to convey. So and comments. Thank you, Alan. We got some nice comments uh, on our, our comments back to the folks. Uh, Alan mentioned, you know, don't be afraid to experiment. I'll use that term with your post-processing. Do the same with your camera. And I'm sure people have said, have your camera book with you. That's always a good idea, but don't be afraid to do some, try something out of the ordinary, something a little different, uh, if nothing else, positioning or, you know, light, things like that. You'd be surprised how dramatic it is and something you may want to add to your book of goodies. Let me give an example of what Jay just said. Uh, I recently photographed a buck moth at a very small natural area close to my house. And it's a moth that flies, meaning it exists an adult, for only a few short weeks of the year. So across three days that I went, 
and those three days were spread out over a week and a half. I'm extreme, I'm possessed, I'm an addict. I shot 3,500 frames of this moth. I shot it from above, from below, backlit, frontlit, you know, three quarter profile, high uh, depth of field, shallow depth of field. You know, I mean, I went to town because I have to wait another year for them to show up again. And I mean, I had a blast. And, you know, you can go home and even though it's a royal pain in the neck and I do this to myself, so consider it masochistic tendencies where I now have to go home and hit that delete button hundreds of times or buy extra external hard drives. But the fact is, I got a series of shots and angles that depending on what I'm gonna do with my images, it's for, if it's for publishing in a field guide, if I'm entering it into an art competition, I have images that cover the gamut, you know, and what's your favorite picture may not be the selected picture for a publisher. So if a publisher comes to you and says, you know, Jan, Rachel, Holly, Scott, we love your images of whatever it is that we've seen that you have out there. Can you send me three for consideration for publication? And they may very likely pick the one you like the least because it tells the story the publisher is looking to tell. So that's why it's nice to have that variety. And I tend to overdo what Jay said. Jay will move two or three feet one way or and the other way and for as long as the subject stays, I'm two feet, 10 feet, 12 feet, I'm up, I'm back, I'm moving around. I'm trying to make it backlit if feasible. Uh, you know, I'm trying to get the lighting on the face depending on my angle. And again, it's always up to the subject and how long it will pose for us. So, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, what it does too is it helps you to break out of your comfort zone. And I don't know about the rest of you, but oftentimes my favorite picture on the back of my camera's LCD screen is typically not my favorite picture when I look at it on my computer. So what I think is successful in the field is not at all something and may be subject to that infamous delete button I've referenced earlier. So don't be afraid to experiment, period, in the field with angles and light, in the digital darkroom with composition, you know, digital allows us that freedom. The number of times you can snap that shutter button is all up to how much charge you have on your battery or extra battery and how many uh, flashcards you have with you. So again, it's your style and your preference. So keep that in mind. We'd any like to thank you for any joining us for anyone? critique. Thank you so very much. It was terrific, really. Oh, thank you're very you. welcome. But again, beautiful work from everyone. Um, I am extremely impressed. I'm always impressed with the A group, but tonight I think the B group blew expectations out of the water. I was not expecting, uh, you know, pretty much every image was excellent tonight. So, so very well done. You're all doing a great job. You've, you, you've, everyone's setting a really high standard. That's they great. are. They, they really are. I think, I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful. You know, but again, what I encourage you to do is the comments that Jay and I made. It's not about whether you agree or disagree with it. How do you apply that comment to your work? And how do you grow as a photographer from those comments, whether it's applied or not applied? And when I say applied or not applied, if you've thought about it and haven't done it, you've applied it. But at least you've thought about it. And that's the important thing at the end of the day. Sorry, Scott, go ahead. No, no, I was, you guys, no, I, I, the only, I made a comment before and I just want to reemphasize it. The fact that you guys are taking the images, putting it into your uh, uh, digital programs and, and manipulating it and showing us how to do that is such a great learning experience because you're showing me the potential that you could tell me, but you know, as the cliche goes, the picture's worth a thousand words. So you're actually showing me what the picture can be. And that's really, that's really so helpful. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know, Scott is not just a face on Zoom. He is also the president of Autobahn Everglades. So his comments mean a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, again, folks, um, please watch the calendar. We got several events coming out, uh, coming up, and um, let us know what you think on the uh, survey because that's what's going to drive what we'll be doing over the next few months and next year. And correct Have me a great if I'm wrong, Jay, the survey is on the web page. Okay. Yes, it is. It's been sent out before. Um, if anybody you know, can't find your questions, I think you all have my name and number now, my email address at least, or you can send to AE exec, and that's Alan and I. All right. Well, thank you very much again, everyone. Great job. Keep doing safe photography out there, and uh, we will see you at the next meeting. Good night. Okay. Uh, have a great Thank evening, you. everyone. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we had a very, very wonderful and uh, exceptional group of images tonight. You guys are so good, by the way. I'm, I'm, I, was, I'm, I was really shocked at the B group when I started going through it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think in some cases, some of the B group images were better than the A group images if we were to do image to image. Uh, so very strong showing from everyone. I, I am seriously impressed. I agree. When Jay started showing some of those, I'm like, is he really doing the B group? I really had to look to make sure it was a B group entry. And it was interesting. Rich said something to me over the last couple of days when I was talking to him, but not everybody has the tools that we might have. Um, so that's one of the reasons I said, what's the basic tool I can do on Windows? And I was kind of surprised with that, that tool, what I could do with it. Right. Um, yeah, granted, I couldn't do a lot of things I would normally do, but quick and dirty, or if you're just learning. Right. It'll let you do the basics. Right. And, and one of the, you know, the most basic thing, and you guys did it all the time, was just crop, crop, yeah. crop, yeah. you know, slightly recenter, slight, you know, mm -hmm. slightly shift, shift it. I mean, that's what you guys kept doing. That was so good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it demonstrates, and I wanted to emphasize, don't be afraid. There's a great function called undo. <laughs> yes. Or you can save it in multiple well, areas what the that's heck what I said too. save it as two or three files you know and yeah no that was great and and again i it's a, i i almost think it should be a prerequisite that any critiquer puts it onto some kind of a program to demonstrate what you can do with the photo because i agree awesome. i agree when we're on this digital platform yeah. it's a great way to convey visually what you're talking about yeah because it's one thing to tell someone it's another thing to show someone. I mean, you know, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's a critique, a workshop, I think it always is great firsthand. Yeah, no, we've done, it th we've done it three ways. Mike did it with Lightroom. I did it with just basic windows. You did it with uh, Photoshop. Photoshop. So, right. you know, th there's the three probably major ways that people would do something. Right. It may not be Windows the way I did it, but it's a, a, one of the basic programs. Yeah. Nancy, you've been really quiet out there. I see you're you mute, muted. You're the critique. I think she took uh, a lady. <laughs> what do you have to say? <laughs> Nancy, are you awake? <laughs> she, may, she, may have, she may have left her screen. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I, I think. I actually missed part of your uh, uh, critiquing, Jay, because I, I had some phone calls I had to take. They were- Yeah, that's okay. We badmouthed you while you weren't there, so. Well, I, I had a feeling. It was like it was like little pins were being stuck in me, so I-, I Unfortunately, felt... Scott, when I hit the record button, it didn't record. I didn't notice that it wasn't recording until about the third image in. Okay. So in the future, when I hit record, I'm going to have to stare at it to make sure it did. Actually, it did Mary record. sent something to me, and I was I should have typed it into the chat, and that's when I got the phone call. So I, I had oh, to okay. right in the beginning. I I got to one photo with Jay, and then I had to get up and, and right, do it. right. I did the I, same thing with the with the record. It's you know there's something about it. If you don't hit it quite right, 
it doesn't take off. Yeah. And you, you start speaking and then you're not focused on that. Yeah, so what I have to do from this point forward is I have to make sure it is recording before I look away. <laughs> yeah. oh, by, by the way, guys, uh, Sean already on the website has removed the um, photography club payment option. Okay, good. So that's no longer available, you know, so, which is good because actually, I don't know what the new, the new young lady tonight who joined, uh, I, we may, we may, we may refund her because she just, you know, she didn't even get a chance to put any images in it. Right. So. Um, okay. I was wondering about that. You know, we can make it an option or we can offer her, you know, two years of membership. And there is no, uh, there, is no there is no fee for membership. For, 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 no, I mean, Audubon Everglades. Oh, that, 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 then she'd be underpaying. Okay. Yeah, okay, then a refund is easier. <laughs> we'll, we'll probably do that. But uh, she seems great. Oh. I mean, she's our youngest member. <laughs> oh, yes, that is true. Unless See, she looks... We're getting new demographics already. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we also changed it so that now students who join are only $10. Okay, very so that good. That also has been changed. Okay, very good. For AE, that, that's, for, that's for all right. of AE. So hopefully right. that'll attract you know, maybe a little bit more younger demographic. Right. That, that's our goal. All right. Well, well, tonight was longer than I expected. I thought I was talking so quickly and I'm surprised to see it's almost nine o'clock. You guys always have a lot to say, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> but less than uh, Scott. You, with <laughs> the photos, cool. do you think it was too long or do we? Not for me. I mean, you know, I don't know for anybody else. I mean, I thought whatever you guys said was great. So everybody didn't seem like we've lost anyone. No, 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 we no, lost only about three people. Uh, 24 were logged in at the beginning and 21 were on at the end. So, so at one point there were 28, by the way. Oh, okay. I, I stopped looking because once I'm sharing my screen, I couldn't see any of those menus. Right, right, right. But 28 okay. were, were, that's the highest number I saw was 28. Okay. But even, if, uh, but even if people don't stay for the whole thing, I do think all the comments that were made are meaningful. Absolutely. So even if they don't stay for the whole, the, the people who would stay for the whole thing is to see what the quality throughout all the submissions are. I think the people who would leave early either had a commitment or didn't want to hear the same thing differently per image. Uh, to me, the point of staying on is to see the quality of the club and the comments. Sometimes once they see their image, they'll move on. Right, yeah. right. Um, Okay, well, I, I'm going to call it an evening. Yeah, so I'm going to run. Um, Scott, I want to go ahead and um, contact and set up something with the eight groups I've been talking to. And I want to see if we can, you know, start putting up programs on that listing uh, that I put together. Have they had programs? So in the near future, you, you, can, you and whoever is involved with programs, here's another list to go select from for next year. All right. Uh, I'm going to leave my computer up and running, but I won't log off yet. Jay is- I'm gone. Scott's, <laughs> Scott's muted, so he's not saying anything. That, that, that was accidental. <laughs> OK. Well, have a great night. I'll talk to you all soon. Good night, guys. Take care. <laughs> OK, good night.